Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. I'm Troy Moling, and thanks for joining us today on Market Journal. Glad you could spend a little bit of your day with us. We've got a good show straight ahead for you. And beginning the broadcast, according to the latest USDA Crop Progress Report, 13 states have begun corn planting. No numbers in for Nebraska yet, but Texas farmers lead the nation with 57% of their crop in the ground. Overall, growers have planted 4% of this year's crop. That's 1% ahead of this point in 2020 and the five-year average. Darren Newsom, president of Darren Newsom Analysis, joined me Wednesday for a closer look and a detailed check of the markets. Yeah, right now, I haven't heard a lot about planters rolling. I know there has been some. I uh, visited with a, with a gentleman actually over in Southern Illinois, where in his area, mo uh, soybeans go in before corn. And so, you know, I, I'm not hearing about a lot of corn being planted at this point. The concern right now is this is a cold blast, not only that we're seeing this week, but the one that's in the forecast for the coming weeks where, you know, what it's going to do is it's going to slow everything down again. Those crops that have been planted, germination is going to slow down. Uh, it doesn't change anything about new crop, both corn and soybeans are bullish, but I think it puts a spotlight back on the corn market uh, in particular because you know, we, we needed to rebuild the corn stocks and it just doesn't look like it's gonna happen. Give me an idea of the basis that we're seeing in corn and soybeans, the movement there and what that number is telling us. Well, in the middle part of this past week, we saw a soybean basis, the national average soybean basis. And what I look at is the, is the commodity national soybean basis index uh, created by bar chart. And what, what it is posted 33 consecutive days. It had posted 33 consecutive days of, of stronger, of stronger values. So, I mean, it has strengthened 33 days in a row, basically since it rolled to the May, 2021 contract. It's just an incredible run. Corn has done much the same. So we've got incredibly strong basis going on right now, both corn and soybeans. What it tells us is even though we've seen demand slowing down, particularly in, in uh, soybean exports, uh, what we've got is an incredibly tight supply situation. And, and that's what basis is telling us right now. All things, all argument, all discussions in the grain industry start with basis. And Darren, let me get in a question about wheat. We've been seeing some news there. What's been the driver in that market? Yeah, you know, as, as we hit midweek, uh, wheat all of a sudden just exploded higher. We saw some cold temperatures uh, earlier this week, you know, with with uh, sub freezing moving as far south as as uh, south excuse me as uh, west central Kansas, and so you know there is a concern, and then their you know forecasts are calling for more sub freezing temperatures across the plains. So again, I think it comes back down to weather. We we saw an incredible rally leading off with the winter markets. So I think this is going to continue. I, is it a little premature to get overly excited about freeze damage in wheat? Yes. I mean, it, it, it's very resilient. I like to call it the cockroach of the grain world. It just doesn't like to die. It can survive just about anything. But the market seems to be concerned. And again, this is the market following the weather. Weather's turning cold uh, here in the spring. Futures market is reacting. And so we have to give it some room, have to let it run probably give us some pretty good selling opportunities, you know, for those producers who are looking to get some, uh, some new crop wheat hedged along the way. And next up, let's talk about South America. We could probably spend an entire interview discussing what's happening in South America, but for the sake of time, give our viewers one or two of the main things that you're watching that we need to be aware of. Okay, issue number one, the Brazilian real is incredibly weak. Uh, it continues to hang near its long-term lows while the dollar is trying to firm. So what this has, you know, it, you combine that with the new supplies that are available due to harvest in South America, particularly in soybeans, uh, we're looking at Brazilian port prices well below those that we're seeing here in the United States. This has led to a conga line basically stretching from Brazilian ports to China right now. The question is, will this continue? How long will this continue? And will China do what it did last year and basically drain uh, Brazil? 
Brazil of its supplies and have to turn back to the US? And if so, where are we going to get the supply? So the biggest things I see in Brazil right now, the incredible exports that it's doing right now, the cheap Brazilian real and the, and the, uh, and the lower price for Brazilian soybeans than US. And Darren, let's end things today with any marketing or risk management advice that you want to leave us with that we can take away from today's conversation. Yeah, you know, I, I think what we have to do is, it, you know, we don't see these opportunities very often in corn. Probably the, the last time we saw a situation develop like this was in 2005, 2006, and that carried over into the summer of 2008. What we have to be very careful with here, again, comes back to weather. If it turns hot and dry uh, with the ability of specs now, or investment funds and speculators to double the, their position size, you know, we could really see an explosive market as we move through the spring and summer on any sort of weather concern. So we have to give these markets plenty of room. We have tight supplies coming out of one marketing year and into the next. So I'm not going to sit there and I'm not going to put a lot of targets in place. I'm going to let these markets run. More, more often than not, I'm going, to use, I'm going to use stops, sell stops, trailing these things. So I want to see a good momentum change before we start loading up the books on 2021 production. Next week, we'll be joined by Trade Oss's Doug Simon. Next up, if rainy weather this month has delayed you getting into the field for planting, it might be an opportunity to use the extra time to make sure your center pivot irrigation system is in good working condition and ready to go for when the time comes. Irrigated Cropping Systems Extension Educator Steve Melvin has a checklist of a few things he likes to remind producers. First off, I always tell guys if it's got electricity hooked to it anywhere, and even a hydraulic pivot probably has an electric uh, hook to it that turns a hydraulic pump or something. So just make sure you always, you know, turn the disconnect off, and there's a place to put a padlock on that, and and uh, put a padlock on it. I mean, today and age, when people can start pivots from, you know, their cell phone from Hawaii if they're on vacation, even you know, we just need to make sure that somebody doesn't start it, even if you're just you know, fixing a flat tire and, uh, you know, make sure everything's working. And then, you know, if you find a sprinkler's not turning correctly, or maybe it's pulled off and there's just water shooting out, or there's, uh, you know, a leak somewhere, you know, take note of all of those and, and get those fixed. Steve also says you'll want to make sure the pivot's water pressure is correct, since it's the most critical thing to monitor during the growing season. One thing that I suggest is that we figure out a good way to measure pressure. And a lot of times there's a pressure gauge out on the pivot, but it's been there a few years and we're not quite sure it works right anymore. In fact, the one that stays on 40 pounds when the pivot's off, we know that one's no good, right? But uh, if we take one of these uh, Schrader valves, it's basically like the stem valve stem on a, on a tire that we put air in with. But with this one, we can screw it into the center pivot at the pivot point, and uh, we can then get a air chuck with a grip on it and put the, the pressure gauge on it. We can clip that on, on the center pivot, start it up, and we can see where it's at, or if it's running even, we can put it on and see where the pressure's at. The nice thing about this is we can spend some money and get a really good gauge, and then when we're done with it, we can put it in the glove box to pick up or back at the shop, and and we can go, if we've got you know 10 pivots, we can check all of them with the same gauge. And that way we know that it's okay and everything's in good shape. Also, I encourage people to put those uh, Schrader valve at the end of the machine and park the, you know, get the pivot to the highest point in the field. And particularly later in the season when the pressure tends to drop off, you know, take that gauge out there and clip it on and see what the pressure is. It should be five pounds more than the pressure uh, posted on the pressure regulators. And it may go without saying, but the operator's manual has a good section on items to check before starting the pivot in the spring, and it should be followed. Next up, as producers make their way through the latest calving season, some are already making plans for the next. But setting up a successful breeding season starts with proper management of postpartum anestrus in beef cows. That's a period of temporary infertility as the animal's body returns to a fertile state. However, this can be particularly challenging with late calving cows. Market Journal's Bill Dodd spoke with UNL cow-calf specialist Casey McCarthy to discuss a few best practices. As producers continue through calving season, one worry at this point in time may be late calving cows. These late arrivals can cause challenges for cattle through a limited breeding season. As such, having an effective plan in place for reproductive health and limiting the impact of anestrus will be paramount to ensuring your cows are well prepared for the next breeding season. Your first concern after calving should be proper management of the postpartum interval. While many variables play into proper PPI management, body condition score will be a big factor in that equation. 
And so generally, when we think about a postpartum interval, uh, we think about a 365 day calving uh, season. And within that, we've got gestation, which can vary anywhere from 270 to 285 days. That varies uh, depending on breed uh, and age. Uh, but then we have roughly an 80 to 85 day time period of this uh, time frame called uterine involution and postpartum interval. So when we think about managing that postpartum interval, uh, one big factor that we might think about is body condition score. And so when we think about that energy reserve in those females, uh, a really good time point to help that postpartum interval is gonna be before calving. And so this is a time period where we move through the later stage of gestation. Uh, we can ultimately increase those body reserves in those females uh, moving into calving. That will impact uh, the rebreeding time point uh, during that postpartum interval. And so we can shorten that interval time period just thinking about targeting our body reserves in those females. And so if we can help those with energy reserves that they already have, uh, that ultimately sets them up for success moving into the breeding season. When it comes to moving late calving cows up in the breeding season, there are some measures producers can take, including the utilization of a controlled intravaginal drug release. So when we think about moving some of our late calvers up in the breeding season, this is targeting some of those later calving cows. Uh, one way that we can do that is utilizing uh, estrus synchronization tools. So one uh, such device would be a CEDAR, which is a controlled internal drug release, uh, intravaginal drug release. And uh, this is a progesterone product. And so ultimately what we're trying to target with these late calving cows is cows that are at least 20 days um, postpartum uh, so we can actually have some impact. And so what we can do is utilizing that progesterone is jumpstart those females so we can get them to cycle earlier. Uh, we do see some that don't respond to that depending on that time frame like I mentioned earlier. Uh, but this is a great way uh, to target a very select number of cows to help move them up into your breeding uh, earlier into your breeding season. When planning things like CIDR treatments, the estrus synchronization planner is one recommended resource that is readily available to assist producers in optimal timing of their administration. So this is an Excel based uh, spreadsheet that ultimately lets you uh, select a different synchronization protocol, lets you enter uh, when you want to calve, maybe what your breeding day or time might look like, uh, and then also the type of cows and then the products you're using. And so what this spreadsheet will do is compare different protocols uh, and then throw everything into a really nice calendar and uh, a spreadsheet where you can then go and say, yep, we're gonna you know, pull a cedar on this day, maybe we'll give a shot on this day, and then we have X number of hours before we breed. And so you can compare a number of different protocols if you're thinking about fixed time AI, uh, maybe you're thinking about just utilizing some type of heat detection or uh, utilizing an MGA product. Uh, those will throw all of that in your calendar and allow you to figure out when the best time uh, to administer products uh, and, and work through different protocols will be. And so it's a really nice uh, tool to use um, that'll give you a lot of different comparisons. Above all else, when it comes to setting up for a successful breeding season, one of the most valuable assets you'll have will be your own records. I think when we're thinking about managing this postpartum interval and anestrus, uh, really looking back at uh, your notes and records during calving will be important to think about maybe where those cows were at in terms of body condition. Um, if we had any difficulties with calving, uh, then we can allow those cows maybe a little extra time or we can identify some of those late calving cows. And so I think records uh, and, and keeping really good notes will help with that, as well as understanding where those females are at in terms of condition, and then ultimately where they're at in terms of, of uh, calving date in relation to the start of the breeding season. So being able to identify those Im important dates and, and being able to take a look at those cows uh, throughout these different time points, either during gestation, moving into calving, and then into breeding season will be really important to be successful. As you consider moving late calving cows up in the breeding season, remember, 
Keeping a close eye on BCS scores and proper postpartum interval management will be key things to consider once calving has occurred. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Bill Dodd. Thanks, Bill. If you'd like to learn more about managing postpartum anestrus in beef cows, we've included a few helpful links on the Market Journal website. Next up, if you're buying manure or selling it, well, there's an app for that. UNL Manure Management Coordinator Leslie Johnson spoke with us, and she has the details. I was watching a training on these new, this new app, and I was like, well, what can we do in this format? And it occurred to me that we needed to better connect the livestock producers and the farmers that are using the manure. Um, and so this was one way that we could hopefully make that connection. So the manure app is a way of getting in contact with people. So there's a couple of different tabs on there. There's the main homepage, which tells you a little bit about the app. And then the other tabs are, there's a news, app, news tab where you can see all of the latest manure articles that have been published on our water.unl.edu page. And then there's an events tab, which shows you all of the manure, livestock, and um, water-related events that are going on and have been published through that calendar. And then there's two different contact tabs. Um, one is specific to the UNL manure team to get you in contact with UNL extension. The other contacts tab is manure experts across the industry. So it might be custom manure applicators. It might mean manure brokers where they're buying and selling manure or connecting people to buy and sell manure. Uh, it might be consultants that help you with your record keeping or um, engineering services. You can always go to it in a map form so that you can see who is closest to you as well and search in that area. If you're a livestock farmer, it might help you find a broker that can sell your manure for you. Uh, it might be another revenue source if you're not currently selling your manure. If you are a crop farmer and you need manure or want manure or need somebody to haul said manure, um, you can find the appropriate contacts there too. The app is available for both Apple and Android. You can find a link with more information on the Market Journal website. Moving on now, and new Nebraska Pork Producers Association President Shanna Beatty understands how difficult COVID-19 was for pork producers. She runs Beatty Family Farms in Sumner with her husband Bart and their four children. She knows firsthand the difficulties that came about from processing interruptions and impacts on markets during COVID. That's why she says the industry is eager to get back to the business of promoting pork to domestic consumers, as well as consumers all around the world. You can read more insights from the new NPPA president in the April Nebraska Farmer. Time now for weather with Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist and Market Journal Chief Meteorologist Al Dutcher. Al, this week we saw a mixed bag of rain, clouds, and even some cooler weather over much of the state. What do things look like coming up? Yes, Troy, it's been a very variable week in terms of the temperatures. We've seen the cold air come in with the frontal boundaries early last weekend, and we've been pretty much consistently in this cool pattern the entire week. And fortunately for Western Nebraska, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, we did see some precipitation as was predicted by the models. Unfortunately, it came more in the form of snow than was predicted by the models. We had some pretty significant accumulations in portions of western Nebraska, but overall the benefits of the precipitation far outweighed the variety that it came in. And of course, most locations when we're seeing right now, anywhere between a half and about an inch to an inch and a quarter reported in those areas that missed out on the precipitation in early April. So very, very welcome. As we go forward in time, it does look like this cool pattern, unfortunately, is going to continue. The question is, when does it break? Right now, it looks like we're getting up toward the last four or five days of the month but it could be a little bit earlier. So let's go to the models and see what we can expect. And first thing I'll draw your attention to is the trough responsible for bringing that system within our region is now starting to echo to the east as we start to see it push off toward uh, the mid-Atlantic region. High pressure starting to fill in behind. We're still gonna see some leftover flurry activity across southeastern Nebraska and some light precipitation in Iowa, but this system is weakening somewhat as it moves eastward. By the time we get to tomorrow though, we start to see the ridge try to build in ever so slightly into the region, a little bit 
warmer temperatures, basically back up in the upper 50s to the mid 60s range. And then we have a cold front that's going to be sliding southward as we go into Monday. Right now we see most of the precipitation up across the northern plains. And as we get into Monday morning, we'll see that that front will start to move in the upper atmosphere across northern Nebraska and clear through the state as we regress through the day. At the surface, low pressure stacks up in northeastern Colorado. So most of the moisture, at least through early Monday morning, will be to our north with the most accumulation in eastern Montana. And as we get into Tuesday morning, the second pulse energy coming around this will actually drive the front through the southern part of the state. High pressure comes in behind it with some cooler temperatures, but we should see some precipitation form in the southern half of the state and some light accumulations would not be out of the question considering if it occurs overnight. By Wednesday, this trough starts to lift somewhat toward the eastern seaboard. We start to see some warming conditions trying to build into the western part of the state. Now, we'll get back to normal, but at least we'll be more into the 50s to the lower 60s. Most of the precipitation stays to the east of us. As we get into Thursday, a trough, another trough tries to push southward, but it looks like at this point in time, the coldest of the air will remain across northeastern Nebraska and points off to the Great Lakes. High pressure firmly in control, so you see the precipitation with the northern system. Southern system moves through the southern plains. It misses Nebraska and moves off toward the east. And as we get into Friday morning, another trough looks like it's going to pull some cool air down into the region as we go into Friday afternoon into Saturday morning so that we start to see some lighter snowfall and precipitation that will break out, particularly during the overnight hours Friday night into Saturday morning. So kind of a little bit of a everything you can imagine over this next week, but in terms of precipitation and temperatures, if we look even farther, that cold air starts to slide east. We see this lower probabilities of the cold occurring. Warmth in the west starts to build into our region. We do see a, a below normal precipitation indicated by the quantitative precipitation forecast, but there are some signs that at least some system will move through between the 25th and the 27th. So overall, cool conditions will continue. Thanks, Al. Finally today, Precision Agriculture is designed to help producers improve efficiency on their farms and thereby improve that profitability margin. Nebraska Extension Wildlife Specialist Andy Little uses those Precision Ag technologies in his research with Precision Conservation. Andy joined me to discuss the subject and why he sees Precision Agriculture as the future of farming. It's designed in a way to, again, that, that improving that efficiency so that it helps a producer uh, from their bottom line, be, again, save you money on fertilizer, you know, save you money on seed, being able to strategically place that, uh, that uh, fertilizer seed or say herbicide or insecticide very strategically in the field. And so it's not like kind of the one size fits all per, uh, per se. And so essentially you're able to really uh, apply that really targeted within the field, and that's the really kind of the whole idea. And at the, at the end of the day, will help those farmers actually improve that profitability. What are some specific tools and practices that farmers might want to consider with Precision Ag? Yeah, it's a, another great question. So uh, one of the great opportunities of the University of Nebraska is we have the Orn Farm Research uh, Network, which is uh, piloted by Laura Thompson, and they actually do a lot of work with the Precision Ag in the Precision Ag realm. And so one of the things that, that they do is actually working with those producers and helping them uh, uh, basically test out some of the new equipment that's out there. So for example, variable rate irrigation. So you basically can take and turn, shut off and turn on those pivots at different points in the field, depending on your water needs. Uh, you have soil moisture sensors that can be put into the field, helping those producers know exactly when their fields need to have irrigation on versus kind of the traditional model of basically just applying it whenever they felt like they should apply it. And so those are some of the really innovative approaches. And again, I think the, the great opportunity is partnering with the university through their network, which they have some new tools as working with producers with the yield monitor data, working to help synthesize that data to be able to make those on-farm uh, management decisions. And then kind of along the same lines, you've also had some research on precision conservation. Mm -hmm. So what is this and why is it something that our viewers should be concerned about? Yeah, absolutely. So precision conservation is really designed in a way to help those producers increase the whole field profitability. And so um, you can have yield monitor data, like I mentioned before, where it can identify those consistently marginal areas in fields. So maybe it's an area where a producer knows that, you know, that area regularly gets inundated with water and I'm really not uh, making much money there. And so obviously an agronomist is going to work with them to maybe adjust those nitrogen or their uh, seeding rates within those sections. But another great option you can actually do is be able to employ 
um, kind of a diverse management system. In other words, basically taking and maybe putting those marginal, consistently marginal areas into a conservation program that NRCS, for example, has. So you can go to your FSA office and talk with them about targeting those areas uh, based on, say, yield monitor data. And, and basically the idea is then well, by having that conservation payment plus the basically farming those best yielding acres, you're conserving those marginal areas for say things like wildlife that want to be able to utilize those areas. You're also helping to reduce things like soil erosion on your fields, reduce the amount of water you're having to put on your fields by doing that. And then get, at the end of the day, you're able to increase that whole field profitability. And you'll hear people say sometimes that there are competing interests with ag production and sure. conservation. So what are a couple ways that we can use precision conservation to address any of those challenges? Yeah, absolutely. So that, and that is a, a big challenge. And, and I will say that one of the biggest, uh, or a couple of the biggest issues that we face right now is we have a growing world's population. And so the question of basically food production is obviously at the forefront of that. And how do we handle feeding that many people while at the same time thinking about our agricultural systems to conserve them, reduce soil erosion, reduce water uh, uh, contamination, et cetera. And so from my perspective, when I'm thinking about precision conservation, how people really can use that, is that will, that, that kind of that framework that I just described with those, those challenges, it helps target those areas where they can essentially kind of, you know, get the best of both worlds per se. So they can actually, um, address that question of, hey, how can I handle producing more on my field to, to deal with the growing world's population? But at the same time, I want to take and make sure this farm lasts for generations to come, and I want to make sure we have sustainable soils, for example, and I can do that with targeting conservation strate strategically within that ag system. If you're interested in learning more, we've included some information on the Market Journal website. That's going to do it for this week's show. If you missed a story, be sure to download the Market Journal mobile app, or you can follow us on social media to join in on the conversation. And don't forget, you can get the latest updates on the fight against coronavirus at covid19.unl.edu. Hope to see you right back here next week. I'm Troy Moling. Thanks for watching. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.